afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Joost van der Vandele. It's the second time in Lugana in one week time, and the topic is the same. It's um, basically talking about what Pitstain, or the new hybrid architecture, can do. Um, this time, I can focus a bit more on the science and have a somewhat longer talk, so I'm going to try to cover three different topics. And it's already in the, in the title. It's um, Petascale Resources and CP2K. CP2K is the code that um, I'm one of the main authors of. And then enabling sampling, large-scale models, and correlation beyond DFT. So these are the three topics. And they have a kind of common goal, that is to try and improve the accuracy or the predictive nature of atomistic simulations. And they go along three different directions. Um, they go into us improving the resolution in energy, in some sense the accuracy of the energy calculation, increasing the amount of time we can sample in Monte Carlo or molecular dynamics, and you can see it a bit broader, for example, in parameter space and things like that, and increasing the model size we can study, the kind of complexity or realism of the models. And I think Petascale allows us to make progress in these directions, and if you're very brave, maybe in some of these directions combined. Um, I will talk about these three topics. One about time, how we can sample in density functional theory things like phase transitions, how we can improve the energy resolution beyond what is standard GGA, DFT, and how we can get towards large models by using something that is known as linear scaling density functional theory that you know, um, allows system sizes to grow with a cost that grows proportionally. All of this is based on CP2K, which we brand as the, the Swiss army knife of molecular simulation because it's mostly developed in Switzerland. It's um, a code with a lot of features. It's fairly complex. It's not small, it's about a million lines of, of code now. And it has grown over, over time. So that is a graph of our, of our development that tracks our SVN repository. And you see it's growing at about 80,000 uh, 80, lines per year over the last 10 years or so. And most of this is being developed by, as usual, PhD postdocs that you know, have a science project, but also on the side do um, called development. And it's also quickly evolving. So in two years' time, 400,000 400, lines of difference between two revisions. So you know, there's a lot of code being written to make this possible. We like to combine um, implementation with new algorithm development. So we worked a lot on this HP2C and PASC code design, trying to get in touch with um, both hardware vendors and the scientists in us to, to try and come up with the best solution for the problems. And of course, part of this was inspired by the fact that you know, we had a good feeling that the next architecture at CSCS would be the hybrid machine that we have today. Um, in the last part of my talk, I will try to come a bit more into details on how we've been using the GPUs. One challenge in CP2K is that it has really a wide range of different algorithms. So we have all these dwarfs or kernels. We have regular grids. We have dense linear algebra. We have sparse linear algebras. We have particles that we propagate in time. And then we have a bunch of, of chemical algorithms. So there's not a single dwarf that is there. And it's very easy to shift um, the bottleneck or the computational kernel by changing the input, uh, basically the kind, changing the kind of simulation we do. So you know, one day I can be very worried about sparse linear algebra. Next day I'm very worried about dense linear algebra, just because you know the science problem has changed a bit, and we solve something completely different. So if you want to understand then CP2K, and some people here know that you know it takes a lot of time because you have to to understand which kind of kernel is is active at what kind of benchmark, and it's very difficult to to make synthetic benchmarks. So now first on time, um, the the example I've taken here, it's, it's a bit application driven, is water. This time um, I'm going to focus on, on a bit on the phase diagram. Water has a complex phase diagram. There are 15 different phases of water known experimentally. 
So not just the liquid, the vapor, and ice as you have it around us, but there are many more phases of ice. And I care right now about what happens if you go down in temperature. You go from the ordinary ice, ice 1H, to a different phase of ice, ice 11. And the difference between these two is uh, shown here a bit. The ice uh, 1H is a proton disordered phase, and the phase 11 is a proton ordered phase. But the oxygen lactose is the same. It's just the hydrogens that can be disordered or not. And that is what we can uh, try to address with simulation. We've been walking around on this phase diagram as well, but these are simulations I, I won't discuss today. So this is what I, I showed before in small. This is in bigger. You see protons are disordered. Here, protons are ordered. Experimentally, there is a phase transition temperature at around 76 Kelvin. Now, this is a, a very tough phase transition to experimentally observe, not because this temperature is low. This is uh, a high temperature for the average physicist, but the time scale of the transformation. So it's kinetically hindered. It would take years or centuries to see the phase transition happen if you take pure water and you cool it to 70 Kelvin or, or something in that region. So people have to um, dope the sample to make this phase transition happen more quickly. And even if they dope the sample, they've never made it completely pure. So it's, it's not fully clear. Um, you know, if they have nailed the phase transition temperature and the structure. So it would be nice to, to, um, to simulate this. And also, it's a kind of an assessment of our methods. If we can accurately um, pinpoint the phase transition temperature and other properties of ice, we know that we describe water rather well. And water is a very tricky object to simulate. So this is a nice system because it allows us to assess the quality of DFT for um, water. It's also needed that you describe this at the high level of accuracy. Um, people have, of course, worked on classical potentials for liquid, for water, um, for a long time. But they are not good enough to describe you know, the fine energetics that you need to describe ice correctly. So here are 16 unit cells of ice. These are all different proton orderings in an autorhombic cell containing eight waters. Here you see the relative energies as obtained with a force field. And here you see the relative energies as obtained with DFT. And you see that these two things anti-correlate, meaning that you know, if you use force fields, you're likely going to get it pretty wrong. You get the wrong phase stability. Um, experimentally, people care about the dielectric tensor, or the dielectric constant, if you wish, of this ice phase. Because you might know that if you have a proton disordered phase, you will have a high dielectric constant. If you have a proton ordered phase, you will have a low dielectric constant. And that's what you see here. So this is the dielectric constant as a function of the frequency at which it is measure, measured. But you see here the phase transition temper, the phase transition happened quite clearly near 70 degrees. And this we can sample from simulation, provided we can converge this quantity. So you can do uh, a sampling at finite temperature and finite pressure, basically going through a configurational space, and then average the dipole um, or the, the, the polarization of your unit cell. And then with this fluctuation formula, the second order is somehow related to the dielectric constant. We can also try to fit that with a curie weiss law that gives us the phase transition temperature. Now, this is very tough, but we can do that. And that's an example of this simulation. This is Monte Carlo based on DFT computed energies. And you see three kinds of things happening. You see water molecules rattling around their position. That's the normal random moves in Monte Carlo. You see the cell breathe. That is moves that we need to equilibrate the pressure. And then you see also these protons hop. And that's actually a specialized move to make these kind of um, moves possible. It's very unlikely that a proton would go to a different location in the ice lattice, because it has to satisfy the ice rules. And this move is a special ergodic move that makes um, collective moves of protons, or spins if you wish, basically respecting the ice rules. And that's what you see here. So this actually is able to, to clearly change the positions of the water molecules. And this is one example where Monte Carlo is really powerful. If you would do this with MD, there would be no way you see any of these proton disordering jumps happen. So Monte Carlo is the, the way to go. 
The special thing, but I have no time to discuss this here in detail, even though it would have been maybe interesting, is that we developed a new Monte Carlo algorithm to make this possible. Basically, based on speculation, we could parallelize much better. So we could, in fact, generate much larger um, Markov chain. Sorry. Much larger. Much larger Markov chains than you could do with a standard um, Monte Carlo simulation, which is essentially sequential in nature. This is what we get. So here, the, the left-hand graph shows you how this dielectric constant converges as a function of the number of Monte Carlo moves. And you see, we have to go up to nearly a million configurations. And for those of you have, that have done DFT-based MD or, or Monte Carlo, they will appreciate that this is a lot. Typical simulations are on the order of 10,000 moves in DFT world. But we see we also need that. I mean, 10,000 moves, it would be here in, in the noise. So we have to go up to about a million moves. Here is also an interesting plot. This shows the second um, Im important aspect. The upper plot, the upper line here, is obtained with a standard GGA functional. That's kind of the way DFT is done traditionally, I mean, for many years, 30 years or so. While here we have also plotted the data that we obtained with a functional of much better quality, accuracy, that also includes um, new ingredients, hot refock exchange, so a hybrid functional. And you see that, indeed, this is crucial to bring the computed result closer to the experimental value. So there are two things that we can show here. First of all, you need these higher quality functionals if you want to get the dielectric constant of ice um, more or less correct. And two, you need a technique to sample sufficiently long um, to get statistically reliable values. We can also, from this, fit Curie-Weiss laws, and we find um, transition temperatures, 60 and, and 80 Kelvin, that are in fair agreement with experiments. So you know, this is actually rather remarkable. Within a 10 Kelvin or so, we are near experiment. But what is even more important, with this estimate, we can now um, actually bracket the expected phase transition temperature and perform simulations close to the phase transition temperature, and that's shown here. You see, again, explicit simulations on the order of a million steps. And you see that simulations at a low temperature, so 60 to 80 or 90 K, they find a very high and constant um, dipole moment. And that's correct. This ice 11 phase is ferroelectric. So it, it finds this new phase spontaneously. While if you have a higher temperature, the the moment the dipole of the cell is actually fluctuating, I mean, it finds the, the stable or the, the, the 11th phase, but then goes back again. So it, it's actually sampling both phases. And that can be used to bracket the phase transition temperature even more accurately between 70 and 80 or 90 and 100 Kelvin, depending on, on the method, which is, of course, for the more accurate approach, spot on the experimental, experimental number. Now, this was sampling. Um, and I already indicated a little bit the importance of improving the energy accuracy, this hybrid, non-hybrid functionals. But in DFT, there is this, um, it's called a, a, a Jacob's ladder or a systematic hierarchy of improvements, where you start in what is called the heart tree world, and you go to the heaven of chemical accuracy, and the first rung on the ladder is LDA, the local density approximation that was the approximation that made DFT popular in the physics community. And then came GGA, and that was the approximation that made DFT succeed in the chemistry community. And now people have been including more and more ingredients, for example, meta-GGAs or hyper-GGAs of hybrids. And here these dots are the density functionals that include also virtual orbitals. And that is similar to MP2 theory or RPA theory and, and related theories. And you see that, that for chemical benchmarks that are very extensive, you can clearly see that this is a, a kind of a systematic way of improving the quality of, of DFT. Now, one problem here, I mean, why is not everybody jumping on this highest run, is the computational cost. If you go up this ladder, the computational cost can change by you know, roughly two orders of magnitude if you go from meta-GGA to hyper-GGA. 
and all the two orders of magnitude if you then go to these um, double hybrid functionals, as they're called, fifth run functionals. Now, of course, computers also grow in performance, and we have gained almost two orders of magnitude in the past few years. And so we can move up this, this ladder. Um, so we've been implementing new algorithms to compute essentially this contribution, which is, if you're a chemist, the MP2 uh, contribution. You can also write diagrams. So this is the first few diagrams in many body perturbation theory. Now, how do we do that? Um, well, in principle, it's well known. We have a Gaussian basis set. We can compute four center um, two electron integrals. And then we can transform this to the MO basis. And that gives us these canonical um, two electron integrals. Now, this transformation is very slow. It's difficult to do because you have a very big matrix that has to be multiplied with very small matrices that basically doesn't, doesn't scale and is also n to the fifth in computational cost, where n is the system size. Now we came up with this more direct technique that um, basically employs what we call the Gaussian and plane wave scheme. That is part of this we do directly in real space. We don't have to transform orbitals. We get a potential of the pair density. And now we can integrate that um, on a grid, or numerically if you wish, over the basis functions, and then transform this. The nice thing about this is, first of all, it employs the established technology that we have in CP2K. It's the same technology we use to do standard DFT calculations. And the other thing is it parallelizes very well. Basically, each processor or subgroup of processors can take one IA pair, the many, many of these IA pairs, and then locally they can do all the, the work needed. And given that everything is local, you know, it scales perfectly well. That's shown here. This is a, a crystal of CO2, and you see it scales almost perfectly up to 100,000 MPI processors. So that is, I would say, good scalability for something that is a, a really complicated um, calculation. Nice thing about it, once you use 100,000 processors, you can do a very large MP2 calculation in just like 10 minutes time. I mean, 5,000 basis functions, very few chemists that actually can run something similar and would have to wait sometimes many weeks for calculations that are significantly smaller. Now, this is great, scales well, but it's still very expensive. And so in, pra in practice, we don't use this approach anymore because, um, well, I mean, yeah, because we found something better. I come to that in the next slide. But um, what we did learn, and what also was known actually in the community, is that something like MP2 is crucial if you want to look, for example, at uh, molecular crystals. They have weak interactions, and Van der Waals is important. Van der Waals is not in standard GGA DFT. If you do look at lattice parameters with standard GGAs, they are essentially off by you know, almost 10%. If we do um, Van der Waals corrected DFT or MP2, we get results that are in much better agreement with experiments. So you know, MP2, or at least dispersion corrections, are, are crucial which is not such a surprise, but you know, it's very important in, in practice. This is um, the technique that we implemented afterwards. It's, a, it's an approximation that goes in the name RI, or resolution of identity. And basically, it says these four center, um, yeah, these four center integrals, they can be approximated by what is called an RI expansion. You put in here, essentially, unity, but in a finite basis, so it's a finite expansion of, of unity. And then you only need three center integrals to be computed. And that's, of course, far fewer than the four center integrals. And in practice, the number is not here. You easily gain a factor of 10 or more on the calculation of these four center integrals. Um, it can still be done with our GPW technique, but now we go over the L index instead of IA. And um, the other very nice thing is that it allows for, instead of n to the fifth implementations, to implementations that scale as n to the fourth. And not only for um, well, opposite spin MP2, but also something that is known as direct RPA. So we have an implementation that scales as r to the fourth for both this opposite spin MP2, which is at the heart of most modern double hybrid functionals, and 
um, for RPA. And I won't go in detail, but you essentially evaluate these, these quantities. This is the n to the fourth term. Here is an n to the fourth term. The other nice thing about this is these n to the fourth terms, so the computational bottlenecks, are essentially p gems or pd gems, meaning that if our systems get large enough, they are gem dominated. And that, of course, is far easier to port to a GPU than anything else. Essentially, you can link in CUDA Blast or LibSciAC and hope that you get, you know, essentially peak performance. Um, this new method scales somewhat less good. It goes up to about 30,000 MPI ranks here, but given that it is at least a factor of 10 more efficient, we gain a lot. And here you also see a comparison um, between the calculation with and without GPU. It's on the XK7, so this is local 30. It's a bit of the older architecture. It's not yet uh, ordained. Here you see the speed up that we observe for um, hybrid versus non-hybrid, focusing only on the multiplication part. And you see yeah, the expected uh, four maybe should be even a bit more, but it at least is reasonable. And then since these systems are not yet very large, they are about 100 atoms in size, the total speed up of the application is a factor 1.5 to 2.5. But as, again, this depends just on the size of the calculation. Larger size, this will um, transfer to the total time, more or less. Now, the cool thing about this is that we now can do 64 waters, which is a typical system in ab initio molecular dynamics in just 97 seconds. So that becomes a time at which you can decide to sample or perform molecular dynamics simulations with your system. This is for us very important. Almost all calculations are based on molecular dynamics or Monte Carlo, meaning that a single calculation has to take you know, something on the order of a minute to, be, to become feasible. I mean, we're used to wait, you know, couple of weeks on the result of a calculation, so you know, weeks of sustained running on a big machine, but it's only possible if the individual steps of the calculation are truly fast. So we care very much about strong scaling of our application, and usually we'll push our simulations to the regime where you know, the parallel efficiency starts to, to become less. We usually or often run simulations like at 50% parallel efficiency just to reduce our waiting time from, you know, six months to one month. Um, the scalability, I won't emphasize that. This is the, the end to the fourth scaling. These, these two lines, end to the fourth scaling. This is MP2, end to the fifth scaling. And that's the time the black line is, is um, quadratic scaling is for the three center integrals. This is quadratic because we can exploit sparsity as well. This allows us to do very large calculations is n to the fourth scaling, so RPA calculations we can now do for a few hundred atoms, about you know, 256 water molecules is, is possible. That gives us you know, about 2,000 electrons. We can do that in, in 30 minutes. So we can now study sizes, for example, that are relevant if you look at, at defects in, um, in, in solids. You don't want too small unit cells because also the, the geometry of your system is actually relaxing. So you, you want to be able to describe the system with a few hundred atoms at that level of, of theory. And that has become possible. But the first application that we did was exploiting the fact that we can actually sample 64 water molecules. And, and that's uh, shown in this graph. On the left-hand side, we, we made this our uh, table of content abstract picture. It's taken in my, in my kitchen. Is symbolically shown what the prediction is of GGA DFT for the density of water. If you can compare a standard GGA functional BLIP, you predict that 200 grams of water are 250 milliliters. If you take tap water, you know, that comes out of the tap, that is, of course, experiment, 200 milliliters. And then if you compare that to MP2, you see that it gives a very good prediction of the density of water. It is near, almost spot on. And then this is the structure of water. Um, black is experiment, green is our calculation. This is fair agreement. This is both from experimental point of view and from our simulations difficult to extract. So this, what you see here is this most likely 
still noise that would go away if we didn't use Dane for four weeks, but for four months. And so you can maybe talk a little to <laughs> CSES, what is possible there. Um, but that brings me to the third part of my talk. Um, that is trying to increase the model, the model size, the system size. Um, as I said before, standard DFT calculations, they scale cubically with system size because there is um, essentially a diagonalization step of a Hamiltonian matrix. And if you use standard diagonalization, this is cubic with system size. The other way to think about it is this is enforcing the autonormality of um, the electronic wave functions, the single particle orbitals. If you have n electrons, they could be anywhere in space, and they could interact with all n other electrons. And that makes n times n times full space, again, n, n cube. If you want to enforce autonormality the brute force way, you have cubic scaling. Now, it is possible to do that differently, and this is shown here, in some sense, this is the largest system we could do with the cubic scaling, the, the blue box there in the corner, about four nanometers in each direction. And with the linear scaling, you can go to something that is 20 nanometers. This contains 6,000 atoms, that about a million atoms. So that is what is allowed, so it's possible. What it doesn't bring, and that is uh, unfortunate, and this is somewhat something people expect, it doesn't make small calculations much faster. So there's a, a crossover point where linear scaling takes over. And for small systems, on the order of a few hundred, a few thousand atoms, the cubic algorithms are still faster than the uh, linear scaling algorithms. It does open this kind of new regime. I mean, if you want to study a nanoparticle, for example, here, this is an experimental nanoparticle. It's you know, tiny, if you wish. It's 20 nanometers. If you, if you model that explicitly, it has 1.5 million atoms. So we are, we're just at the point where you know, the small experimental nanoparticles can now be modeled atomistically if you have a million, million um, atoms. Similar here, if you care about our you know, next generation CPUs, we might want to model transistors. They're getting smaller and smaller. Somebody's certainly going to tell me what the, the gate width is right now. It's 22, I guess. Well, that is the scale you know, that we can start to address. If this goes down a few more TikToks, you know, we can actually explicitly simulate that. Or here, another example that is used often in bio simulation, a little virus. It's one of the, the smaller viruses. It's the, one of the first that was simulated um, fully using a classical code. NAMD is, uh, I think, famous for that. The satellite tobacco mosaic virus, it's also about 1 million atoms if you take solvent into account. So virus itself is maybe 300,000. It's a very small virus. And then you know 700,000 atoms of, of solvent water. Um, why can we have linear scaling? What we exploit now is the fact that if you have a localized basis, and in our case, these are Gaussians, then if two Gaussians go far apart, their overlap, which is this blue thingy, goes down very quickly, so exponentially. The further you go, exponentially, this overlap goes away. And that's uh, crucial, because if you simplify a little bit, the Hamiltonian can be seen as two Gaussians and in between a local potential, at least in DFT, GGA DFT. You have a local potential here, meaning that this Hamiltonian matrix expressed in this localized basis set becomes a sparse matrix. And the same for our overlap matrix, which is uh, kind of the metric of our space. And then we have the two matrices that are crucial needed to make the density matrix. And if these are sparse, and we can, in a sparse way, transform them into the density matrix, then we have a scheme that can exploit the linear scaling you know, behavior of, of matter in some sense. This is just to show that, indeed, you know, it's, the, it's the right technique to use. This is a comparison of a cubically scaling algorithm against linear scaling algorithms. And you see this is the time goes up very quickly, while here this goes up um, linearly. Here, this corner is where the crossover point is. So the more we can push these lines down, the more we can move the crossover point to um, smaller systems. These are calculations, and it's important to emphasize, they are calculations done for three-dimensional bulk systems. Because linear scaling calculations done on you know, one-dimensional polymers are very simple. 
because you have very few neighbors. But once you go to the bulk, of course, the number of neighbors is very large. So this is a, a feature of our linear scaling calculations. These are sparse matrices. But if you count the number of non-zeros per row, it's on the order of you know, 20,000 non-zero elements per row because we, we interact with maybe 1,000 atoms or so. We can use it for properties. I mean, this is uh, important. Of course, we, we can like algorithms, but we want to use these algorithms to do interesting science. For example, here we looked at um, a 2D polymer together with an experimental group trying to understand the morphology of the system. It's uh, a few ten thousands of atoms. And we perform molecular dynamic simulations with that system to see how this polymer relaxes. For example, what are the fluctuations in height of this polymer? And does it retain any of the order? Because the experimentalists start with you know, regular monomers. Does it stay like that? And the answer is, of course, well, no, this is not regular anymore. So what's the approach we use to, to make this linear scaling happening? We exploit this expression. It's very similar to um, the expression you might know that relates the density matrix through the Fermi function to the um, Hamiltonian matrix. This is, so to say, the zero temperature limit of that expression in which you replace the Fermi function by a step function or, said in a different way, by the sine function. The sine of a matrix is uh, a matrix function that will take a given matrix. It will retain all eigenvectors, but then map negative eigenvalues to minus 1 and positive eigenvalues to plus 1. And then you can see how this is somehow equivalent to diagonalizing and taking a subspace from your matrix. You can also do that with this approach. And the very nice thing about the sign of a matrix is that there is a very easy iteration to compute it. This is the Newton-Schultz iteration for um, the sign of A. And basically, you can start with A itself in a, in a suitably scaled form, and then iterate this um, formula here that just requires two multiplications per iteration. And this is guaranteed to converge quadratically to the sign of A. So this is a, a quickly converging formula that also is relatively simple to implement. We only need sparse matrix, matrix multiplication. Um, but sparse matrix, matrix multiplication is not so common. There are a lot of codes out there that do sparse matrix vector multiplication, but almost none that do sparse matrix, matrix multiplication. And that's why we started writing this code ourselves. That started um, many years ago. And we've been improving that code to get good performance, scale well, and also to be put to um, a hybrid architecture. And first of all, just to show that we can reach this million of atoms, this is a, an application of this sine matrix iteration. And you see here, this is the wall time against system size, number of atoms. These three lines here are three different methods that use a small basis set. And essentially, for um, these methods, we have a small basis set. We can compute a million of atoms in less than two hours. So that is actually a quick calculation. While if we use accurate basis sets, the basis sets we really would like to use with density functional theory, the calculations become much more expensive. So here we can do 100,000 atoms in what is essentially one day on 40,000 cores. So that is still a very expensive calculation. But um, this is already a bit older data. It doesn't have the proper citation here. That was published in 2012. We're now 2014, essentially. And so we've made some progress there. And I'm going to talk a little through the algorithm first. Um, our sparse matrix matrix multiplication library has this unpronounceable acronym name. It's called DBCSR. And it's optimized for our science case. It is sparse matrices that still contain a lot of data, so 10,000 of non-zeros per row. And that has to be, um, it has to be a performant library also in the dense limit, because a lot of the simulations will be you know, close to the crossover point. And that's why we took an algorithm that is known to be optimal for communication in the dense limit. And for dense matrix multiplication, we know that Canon is um, optimal if you specify that the amount of memory is, is limited. And Canon has this uh, regular communication pattern, which has a um, square root of n ticks. 
So you talk, this is an important feature, you, you only talk to square root of n processes, given n processes, and it has the property that the amount of communication per processor actually decreases as long as you increase the number of processes. It has a slow decrease, it goes down as one over square root of n. And that's, you know, a problem, not so much in uh, the dense case where the flops will outnumber the number of bytes transmitted as n goes up, but it has a problem in the sparse case where the number of data um, transmitted actually becomes larger while the flops is just linear. So this is something we will see later on. But at least for relatively dense systems, this is close to optimal. Now then to, to embed this in um, a code that could deal with you know, the increasing complexity of the hardware, we had to, to work a little bit on, on the software design. And we, we've structured our code such that you know, there's a, a, a part of the code that is aware, aware of the, the full machine, the cluster, if you wish, that communicates with MPI. And then as MPI shifts around the data, this gets delivered to a lower layer that we call the multi-track layer that basically works on the node. This is code that is you know, both OpenMP parallel and MPI parallel. And then our, our scheme, this multi-track layer, has um, a separation of, of concerns, if you wish, or a separation of tasks. This is a sparse matrix multiplication, so there is a lot of index handling going on, and there is some flops going on as well. And we've tried to separate these two, so that we basically build, in our language, stacks of tasks. This is the index handling, what has to be done, which elements have to be computed. And then we ship them to a scheduler, so this is the CSR, the stack generation. Then we have a, a scheduler that tries to decide whether this should go to the CPU or to the GPU, depending on the characteristics of the stack and maybe if the GPU is busy. And then the scheduler will send it to the host or to the device. Um, the device can decide to, uh, to be not cooperative and then send back to the, to the host if needed. And on both the host and the device, we have um, something that we call libSMM or lib CUDA SMM, and that stands for small matrix, matrix multiplication, because we don't have element-wise sparse matrices. We actually exploit the fact that in chemistry, each atom has a basis that is, you know, maybe 15 elements in size or 13 elements in size, and it's logical to, to group elements of the sparse matrix together in, in blocks, in atomic blocks. So they will be on the size of the basis of an atom, typically, you know, between 5 and 25 say just something. And because standard BLAS is not very efficient for such small matrices, we had to come up with our own scheme, both on the host and then later on the device as well. Um, Canon algorithm, I already discussed that. I'm going to skip it. This is, um, I think, a nice, a nice graph that shows the performance of this Canon algorithm. That's a strong scaling graph. So here we have 13,000 atoms. And you see that this scales or speeds up up to about 30,000 cores. So it's less than one atom per core, which for DFT is kind of a good performance. What you do see is this bending. And that's actually the square root of P behavior. So this is the communication that starts you know, not being uh, optimal anymore. So here you see the square root of P, which is related to the communication volume that only decreases as 1 over square root of p. Now, nevertheless, at full scale out, um, we have matrices of the size 100,000 or 130,000 by 130,000. We can multiply them in less than 0.5 seconds. So this is a very quick multiplication. And one self-consistent step takes 24 seconds. So we can do the SCF calculation on 10,000 atoms in you know, a couple of minutes, essentially. Um, this is the other goal. Um, some of you might know that there is still the PASC project, which is the successor of HP2C. HP2C is what funded the first round of development porting to GPUs. Now, in the PASC project, we want to, to go towards this goal, that is to be able to do DFT calculations of arbitrary size and constant time to solution, meaning that if you scale the resources proportional to the system size, the time to the answer should 
be the same, so the calculation should be order one. And right now you see that this is, well, almost the case. So you see it goes from 10 seconds to 20 seconds, going from 10,000 to 100,000 atoms. But we have this square root of p behavior. And that's, again, the communications that are kicking in. And we have some ideas that you know, we want to exploit to reduce the amount of communication so that we get really to a truly order one scaling of, of the code. Now, if we go down a bit on this, uh, in this CSR layer, um, we're getting closer to the hardware, closer to the CPU and the GPU. We have what we call this Multrack scheme. And that's basically um, a cache oblivious way to implement matrix matrix multiplication. We know that you know, for a dense matrix, matrix multiplication is very important to code for the cache, to block your loops, and you know, to make that everything fits perfectly well. And that works very well in, in the case of dense matrix multiplication because the data is very regular. Uh, you, know, you can say exactly, I want to block at you know, 256 rows and whatever, 128 columns. But you cannot do it anymore if you have sparse data because it's very irregular. And one way to go um, towards a more fl flexible scheme is this cache oblivious multiplication that basically tries to make the best out of the cache without assuming particular um, characteristics. And in this case, it does that by doing the matrix, matrix multiplication in a recursive way. So you take your two matrices, you first half them in two, and then you can do a blockwise matrix multiplication. Now, you can do that recursively because you take two blocks. If these are big, you halve them again, and you go down like this in a recursive way. And in some way, this is visualized here. You, you basically access the memory in this, this shape. And the more you go deep in the recursion level, the more you go fine in this thing. And what you can see here is that the memory access is always local. So somehow, this is one way to try to get local memory access without knowing very well you know, the precise characteristics of your matrix. And the nice thing about this is that this will ultimately fit well into cache because you exploit locality without knowing any details. You don't know exactly where, where to terminate this, what is optimal, but at least it, it does, does work. The nice thing about this is it also works for sparse matrices. So you can start to bisect your sparse matrices in this way and, and multiply this in this cache oblivious way. At the given point, this sparse data will fit into cache and it will be exploited as well. And that's why we adopted this. This I already discussed slightly. We have this separation of concerns, index building, and doing flops. And that's important um, for porting to the GPUs, because GPUs are, are great to do you know, flops, but they're very bad in branchy stuff. Trying to decide if two elements have to be multiplied. There's plenty of ifs there. Not regular, nothing good for GPUs. So this is why we've separated that. And, and we will put the indexing on the CPU, while the flops can be shipped to the GPU. And by having this also separated, we can hope to exploit both GPU and CPU for the flops in case that you know, the GPU would be overloaded, which we don't see so often. Now then, we have these very small matrices. I said we have this dedicated library, which we call libsmm, small matrix matrix multiplications. This is to deal with our Chemical block sizes, if you want to put it in the, the words of a computer scientist, with these ugly block sizes. I mean, who cares about the 13 by 13 matrix? Well, unfortunately, we do. That's the size of our basis set. And here you see a comparison between a standard DGEM, as we get from MKL, which is the fastest we could find, against our library. And you can see that you know, there is, for certain sizes, significant speed up by using this self-tuned um, matrix matrix multiplication library. This is a technique that is used in, in other codes as well. Uh, Atlas is well known for its auto-tuning, and, and uh, FFTW, I think, they also do some kind of auto-tuning. And we do it on the source code level. Basically, we will block and unroll loops, and then feed this comp to compilers, and then, in the end, just do runtime benchmarking of each of these kernels and pick whatever comes out as being the fastest. So it's completely compiler-based. We don't do any assembly programming, this is where we put the, the hard limit in our development. For, um, for the GPU, the things became even more complex. We had a lot of help there 
also from NVIDIA, trying to get up, come up with the best kernels. The problem is that these very small matrix multiplications, they are really dominated by memory access, and it basically needs a very smart way of trying to optimize this memory access. And this is done in part by blocking these already small blocks and even smaller blocks, but basically blocking them such that you know, a two by three block fits exactly in the number of available registers. Then you can decide um, here these PA and PB are slabs that are put in shared memory. There are various ways how you can put things in shared memory directly from global to shared, or as we do it first to registers and then to shared. And there are a lot of parameters that can be tuned there as well. Finding the optimal slab width, the optimal number of registers per thread, the optimal number of threads. And again, we wrote an auto-tuning framework to make it possible to find the best kernels. And I, I don't, didn't show any, any data there, but it's really amazing you know, the, the, the difference in performance you can see between a randomly generated kernel and the one that then comes out as optimal. So you can easily see four or tenfold difference in performance. Usually you can you know, rationalize that and say, well, you know, a human coder would never have written that loop, but still you know, there's a, a broad range of kernels that can be generated and only a very small fraction of them is actually giving you something that looks like the optimal performance. Um, we, we looked at this. Um, so here are various block sizes that we care about or cared about. Um, the bars are the measured performance in gigaflops, so we can actually multiply, you know, a 24 by 24 matrix at a rate of nearly 400 gigaflops, which, you know, if you think about the size, 24 by 24 is not really you know, the big thing, and yet we, we get almost one third of the peak performance of the device taking such small blocks, and I think that's very interesting because it's not really what you expect. I already said we are memory bound, that is, we have to transfer these small blocks to you know, the SMs and, and the result back. And so you can estimate what performance you would have if flops were absolutely for free. And you know, just the, the load of memory counts. And that's what you see here. So the dashed line is when you have to load A and B, multiply it, and add it to a pre-existing result C. This is the dashed line, or you can say, well, I don't care about C, maybe I can reuse it, and then you get the solid line. And you see our kernel is in between these two limiting cases. So we confirm this memory bound behavior, but at the same time, um, we show that we are almost optimal in exploiting the memory bandwidth on the GPU. Now, the other thing that took us a lot of time was to make it possible to, to use device, the device in a synchronous way. So this should be really a goal. If you have a lot of memory upload to the device and a lot of MPI, you would like your calculations to proceed, even though MPI is transferring around large buffers or the device is you know, being fed with new data. And so we implemented for both MPI and um, wanted towards the device, a double buffering scheme, so that we can start uploading the next buffer before the previous one has started. And that <coughs> is uh, visualized here. So, you know, yeah, you see that send and receive, essentially, they exchange on the buffers, and also the computation takes place in, <coughs> in an overlapping way. So while MPI send is still happening, we are already processing stacks, and the same here. While this hosted device is running, we still process stacks of the previous Canon tick. So we can effectively overlap the communication rather well. To do this um, overlapping of communication and computation on, on the host, we use our threading. So we have several threads running per MPI task, and basically one gets dedicated towards um, handling the MPI communication while the other ones will generate stacks that are shipped to the device. Now, this is one comparison, CPU against GPU. 
but now focusing only on the kernel and also taking a fairly large kernel. This is a 23 by 23 matrix. It's the size we, we cared about in particular because it's the size number of basis functions on a water molecule. And here you see a very favorable comparison. So we get about 70 uh, gigaflops on 12 cores, which is a dual socket, um, as we said here, I guess Sandy Bridge machine standing in, a, in our offices compared to one K20 card, and you see this K20 card reaches somewhat more than 300 gigaflops. So here is a, a great speeder. This is, of course, only the kernel, and things change, of course, when you look at the full application. This is looking again at this amorph material and two other benchmarks. So we had three benchmarks because they have different characteristics. So the first benchmark is limited or has a lot of, of small blocks. This H2O benchmark has larger favorable blocks, but is communication limited then. And then this titanium oxide benchmark has intermediate blocks, I would say, and is rather balanced. So communication and computation takes roughly the same size, the same time. And here you see the timings we obtained at that time. You see speed ups going from 1.3 to 1.7 on, on this particular benchmark. Now, <coughs> this is on 169 nodes, if I recall correctly. Yeah, 169 nodes. This balance will shift if we change you know, the system size or if we change the number of nodes we run on. In particular, if we go towards more nodes, there's going to be more, more um, MPI transfers compared to the flops, and so this ratio is going to change. This is what you see here that's um, just focusing on one Benchmark, here you see the scalability or the time needed if we just use CPUs for a given number of nodes. Here, what happens if we exploit both CPU and GPU? And I think before we were roughly here in this regime, that was this factor of uh, almost two that we reported. But if you go up, and then we, we can actually also block water molecules bigger, and then we get in, in, in this regime. So this is. There's more flops to be done, but they can be performed more efficiently. So you see this is a more favorable ratio. Then you see a factor of three speed up. But as we increase the number of nodes and get more communication bound, this ratio goes down to about 1.5. So this is, I would say, expected. The other thing you can see here, we've improved this slightly, but um, this calculation is, for example, limited by the amount of GPU memory. So we cannot use few nodes there because we exceed the six gigabyte of memory that is available per uh, GPU. So we have to move up actually towards fairly large node, um, node numbers here. This is, I think, the more interesting comparison. I call it the historical comparison. I showed you um, early on this graph that showed that we could do a million of atoms, but I said, you know, the calculation is fairly expensive. It takes one day on 4, 000, um, 40,000 cores. This is actually the, the black line. So those are calculations run on, on Jagger of PF. And then we've been working a lot on the code, improving, you know, communication and, and libSMM and things like that. And then the new code is actually this code that is now a factor of 20 faster than the data we published in 2012. So even though the CPU-GPU ratio is not, you know, not stellar, actually the improvement of the code as a whole, because everything has been tuned very nicely, is actually quite, quite impressive. So this is, I think, the, the important, the important um, number. I have a few more minutes. Then I mean, one of the applications we want to do look at is Nanoparticles, for example, titanium oxide nanoparticles in my case. I work on um, solar cell research, and in these dye-sensitized solar cells, most of the substrate is actually titanium oxide that then gets functionalized. And here we want to look, for example, what happens if two of these nanoparticles touching and get in contact? Can we model something about this electronic con contact or, or not? Um, we looked at smaller sizes, and then we had one big test case, if you wish, or, or the science case that looks at the aggregated nanoparticles. We can do with our linear scaling called electrodynamics-based relaxation of these nanoparticles in explicit solution. That's shown here. 
Um, so this is a few thousand MD steps that becomes possible. So we can analyze the structure, see, for example, how the surface reconstructs and puts pressure on these nanoparticles. And we can also run the, the full case. So the matrix dimensions here, for example, the Hamiltonian matrix is about 700,000 by 700,000 in size. We can threshold at 10 to the minus 6 and need about 50 SCF steps to converge that. So in total, we need to do about 2,000 matrix matrix multiplications of that size just to get a single, a single energy. Now, here you can do the number of dense flops. So if we would not exploit sparsity, it would be this kind of uh, number that I cannot pronounce. And the actual flops needed, if you actually use sparse code, you see is, is significantly better. So we gain about a factor of 2,000 in you know, the number of flops needed. So even if we are not reaching peak performance of the machine, you know, maybe off by a factor of 10, we still see a very significant boost in performance by going towards these sparse um, algorithms. If we analyze how much of these sparse flops, flops actually end up on the GPU, we see that, well, you know, 99% uh, is actually going to the GPU. So this elaborate scheme of shifting work to maybe CPU or GPU was not really needed. We can run this on the full Dane, 5,000 nodes, and that takes somewhat less than two hours to get the electronic structure of the system. If we look at the flop rate, well, it's not great. It's uh, about 130 teraflops. But if you convert back to what we call marketing flops or sustained dense flops, it actually runs to about 300 petaflops. Now, <laughs> I would like to, to finish acknowledging people. Uh, you've seen work of, of um, various people. Um, there is Urban, who worked a lot on the sparse matrix multiplication library. Mandes, who worked on, on the ice and the sampling, the enhanced sampling. And Mauro, who worked on um, the MP2 calculations. I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>